Well, good evening, everyone. And welcome to the seventh episode of The Wild World of Bees. I'm Lincoln Best, taxonomist for the Oregon Bee Atlas, and I'll be your host this evening. The Wild World of Bees is an online lecture series you can enjoy from the comfort of home during this harrowing statewide bonfire and global pandemic. Through this series, we'll hear from great bee researchers and advocates from around North America and the world, but often with a focus closer to us here in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. This series is brought to you by the Oregon Bee Atlas, a citizen science-based initiative to document the bee fauna of Oregon. The Bee Atlas is the biodiversity-focused arm of the Oregon Bee Project, a partnership between OSU Extension, the Oregon Department of Forestry, and Oregon Department of Agriculture, and it's dedicated to poll pollinator health statewide. This series is sponsored by Mount Pisgah Arboretum in Eugene, Oregon, and by the Native Bee Society of British Columbia. You can visit their website, bcnativebees.org, to learn more about their fauna, flora, and local initiatives. Now, I know the Washington Native Bee Group is actively growing, so if you're interested in contributing, try networking in the chat room with some of the Washingtonians that are present. Now, in last month's episode, I had the pleasure of hosting local to Oregon colleagues, Sandy DeBano and Scott Mitchell. In their talk, they toured us through their native bee research in the grasslands and associated forest systems of Northeastern Oregon. And they introduced us to their many discoveries of native bee community responses to landscape impacts. You can find their talk on our Oregon Bee Atlas YouTube channel, seen here. And please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Now, next month we'll be hearing from Lauren Panicio, who recently moved her lab from University of California, Riverside to the University of Oregon Institute of Ecology and Evolution. Professor Panicio has an amazing portfolio of research from the Southwestern deserts, and I'm excited to hear about her sunflower bees and more. Now, this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, Sarah Johnson. She's our founding president of the Native Bee Society of BC, a PhD researcher at Simon Fraser, um, recipient of Canada's most prestigious graduate scholarship, and she's neither the first nor the last to shed a tear in one of my bee courses. Sarah has led bumblebee research across Canada from Nipigon on the north shore of Lake Superior to the high alpine of the coastal mountains overlooking the Chilcotin deep in the BC interior. If you want to hear more from Sarah and more about her work, you can find her on episodes 27 and 145 of the Pollination Podcast. Now, if you have any questions for our guests, and I really hope you do, um, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll moderate them after the talk. Otherwise, please feel free to use the chat function. There's all sorts of incredible people that keep tuning into these um, webinars. And so you might, uh, you might strike up a, a collaboration there. And so with that, I pass it over to you, Sarah. Awesome, thank you. All right. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, there we go. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Lincoln. And it's actually really funny that you mentioned <laughs> my crying in the B course because I was actually pondering back to that moment as I was making this presentation as kind of a look how far she's come moment. <laughs> the first Bumblebee ID course that I took from Lincoln, I cried because it was so hard, but now I'm a Bumblebee lover. <laughs> so thank you so much for the great introduction, Lincoln. And 
I am going to be talking today about bumblebees. I have been working with bumblebees for almost a decade now across Canada, but have spent considerable time in the western portion of the country, specifically the two westernmost provinces, British Columbia and Alberta. And this area in particular is a pretty special place for bumblebees as BC is actually the most bumble diverse of all states and provinces in North America. And uh, pre-warning, my talk today is really mostly just gonna be a bumblebee hype session. So hope you all realized what you were signing up for. Uh, and I'll be splitting it up into three categories. First, I'm going to do an introduction to bumblebee biology with a tour through the bumblebee life cycle. Uh, then I'm going to get into a bit of a discussion of the incredible bumblebee diversity in this area and followed up and with a specific focus on regional declining species and some of the accidental conservation research that I have planned for my PhD. So we will get started with an intimate look into the life cycle of the bumblebee. And this photo here shows a bumblebee nest box and it is housing a colony at its peak level of production with three workers gathered outside at the entrance. And all of that splatter all over the front of the box is copious amounts of bumblebee poop. So I decided for my introductory tour of bumblebee biology to walk you all through the bumblebee life cycle in stages for a bit of a more intimate overview of the secret life of bumblebees. So if you are familiar, bumblebees are an annual species where queens are the only individuals that survive over winter and colonies are initiated, grow and decline within a really shortened or restricted spring and summer period in temperate regions regions like ours. So we will get started with spring, which is when the big, loud, and very hungry overwintered queens emerge from hibernation and start looking for a place to nest and establish a colony. So she's going to be waking up from her nap and is immediately looking for food, which is pollen and nectar for bumblebees, to support both herself and her colony in the early stages of its growth. So bumblebee queens are solely responsible for finding a place to nest and they spend a lot of their time in the spring looking for the perfect spot. And bumblebees on the spectrum of different kinds of bee nesting strategies are generally considered what is termed renters. So queens are usually looking for pre-existing cavities to build their nest within and usually won't do any self-excavation, though stay tuned for an interesting video in a few slides. And so typically when most people think of bumblebee nesting, we think underground and a lot of species will use things like abandoned rodent burrows. Um, and on this slide is a photo series of a queen central bumblebee, Bombus centralis, investigating a very attractive looking hole, but she eventually left, uh, apparently deeming it unsuitable for reasons that are likely only obvious to a bee. And so it's generally been suggested in the literature in past research that um, bumblebee biologists have done that most bumblebee species typically prefer to nest underground with some species more likely to specialize on nesting above ground in like tree cavities, for example, or in vegetation on the surface. Um, but when you think about it, bumblebee nesting is really difficult to study. So some genetic research actually suggests that bumblebee nest density can be up to two nests per species per hectare. And a hectare is about the area of the grass in the middle of like a 400 meter track. So if you think about that, that's each species could have up to two nests in that area, which is quite a lot over an entire landscape. But how many bumblebee nests have you come across in your life? Probably not very many. So to try to get around the difficulty of locating these wild nests, I've actually been part of a handful of studies across Canada using artificial nest boxes to gather more information on species-specific nesting preferences and nesting biology. 
And the data on this slide are actually from Alberta and Ontario, which is more of an eastern central province in Canada. Uh, but all of the species except for one listed here, their range actually extends all the way into either BC or Alberta or both. Um, and from this graph, you can see that certain species do seem to be specialists. So on the left, we have Bombus impatiens, which only ever occupied ground boxes. And then on the far right, we have Bombus perplexus, which only ever occupied tree boxes. But you can see in the middle, there are actually quite a few species that regularly used both above and below ground boxes or multiple types of above ground boxes, which is pretty cool. And so once the queen finds a suitable location for her nest, she's essentially on her own establishing her initial colony. Um, she'll build a honey pot out of wax to store nectar um, in the nest, and she'll be out collecting a nectar supply as well as pollen to feed the first of her brood of developing larvae. And pollen contains protein that's really critical for developing baby bees, whereas nectar is more carbohydrates that best serve adult bees for energy. So this is the cool video I mentioned earlier that I actually took of a Hunt's bumblebee or Bombus huntii, who appeared to have selected a nest location, which you can see the small hole entrance that she's in front of right now, in my backyard in Calgary a few years ago. And like I said earlier, usually queen bumblebees are looking for a space to rent and are not much for self-construction, but this lady was doing a bit of cleaning up, scuffling around, rearranging dirt at the entrance to her future dwelling, which I thought was pretty cool. So once a nest has been established and the first brood of workers emerges, the queen can thus retire from foraging duty to stay behind and continue laying more eggs, while the workers take over collecting food for the growing family. And bumblebees are fantastic foragers, and they're often considered to be some of the highest quality pollinators, uh, given that they're pretty chunky and they have copious amounts of pollen clinging hair all over their bodies. They also have really impressive cognitive abilities, and they're able to learn to handle a variety of differently shaped flowers using information both collected on their own and social learning, which is cool. Um, and they're also at the genus level generalist, and that means that they can visit a variety of different kinds of flowers, but often individuals will actually specialize on one or a few species of plants, which happens to be a beneficial strategy for both the bee and the plant. Um, individual bees will then spend less effort learning how to unpack the different goodies of too many different types of plants. And if individual bees are restricted in their veg visitation, they're more likely to successfully pollinate said plant by transferring the right type of pollen between the same plant species. Uh, there can also be some degree of within species specialization in bumblebees. For an example, anecdotally, I have frequently observed that brown belted bumblebees, Bombus griseocolis, is a huge fan of milkweed. For some reason, they're always on milkweed. So sometimes certain species can have certain floral preferences as well. And another super cool study that came out earlier this year from a research group based in Zurich unearthed a particularly impressive adaptation that bumblebees have developed that we just had no idea about, where they actually make small incisions in plants by biting the leaves, and this induces earlier flowering in the plants. So the bumblebees are essentially acting as impatient gardeners by forcing plants to bloom up to an entire month early. So super geniuses, in my opinion. Um, Google this paper for more info. It's very cool. 
And so these photos that were hidden by my text actually illustrate a few bizarre foraging methods that I've accidentally caught bumblebees employing since I spend so much time staring at bumblebees. Uh, photo number one on the left there is a worker foraging on not a flower, but the tip of a branch of a subalpine fir tree at high elevation in central BC collecting maybe sap sugar. Your guess is as good as mine here. <laughs> and then photo number two is another strange foraging bout where I followed several worker bumblebees as they seem to be attempting to lick in between the seeds of this subalpine willow species. You can see her tongue sticking out to kind of get in between those little seed pods. And then photo number three is of a bumblebee handling a lupin flower, which are really popular garden flowers that you've likely seen before. Um, however, I didn't notice, which I'm a little embarrassed about because I photograph bees on lupin all the time, but until reviewing some photos recently that foraging on lupin requires some really impressive bee ingenuity. So this bee, you can see, is biting onto the top petal and using her legs to push down the lower petal to access the reward. And most lupin species only offer pollen, which you can see is bright orange in the color packed into this bee's curricula or pollen baskets. And you can also kind of see on this flower, and if you look closer at any lupin, now you'll probably notice there's like some browning of where the bite marks from bumblebees have been using this rather effective brute force strategy to get at the reward here. So I have a couple videos of some adorable foraging bumblebees to share with you all. I will never get over how cute it is to watch bumblebees scurry quickly across plants from the carrot family with these umbel-like flowers. And then this queen takes her time slowly sipping nectar from a dandelion and you can see her tongue poking in and out of the flower here as she drinks. Bye. And then this one was a bit odd for me to accidentally come across as well. So this is a laurel shrub in my front yard. And last year I noticed that were, there were tons of insects around it, but I couldn't see any flowers or anything that was obviously worthwhile to hang around for. But this kind of plant actually has something called extra floral nectaries at the base of the leaves, which are just little nondescript holes filled with nectar that that bumblebee was searching out, which offers a sweet reward for the more industrial pollinator who don't need no flower for guidance. And so moving into the later summer is when activity starts to kind of crest and decline for most bumblebee colonies with the last of the generations of workers now joined by reproductives, new queens and males as well. And here is an intriguing bee behavior that I observed in one of our particularly exposed nest box colonies strapped to a tree in an open meadow with full sun exposure. So this was a really hot late summer day and those workers were trading off on fanning duty, circulating air through the colony inside to prevent their precious wax from melting. We could peek at them again. And here, is a closer look at the interior of a mature bumblebee colony. You can see here the larger bees are queens. One is the foundress queen or the mom, and one is likely a newly born daughter queen uh, with workers and males kind of scuttling about beside them tending to a few capped egg cells. And this video was actually taken in Ontario during my time working with Wildlife Preservation Canada on recovery for this particular species, the yellow-banded bumblebee or Bombus tricola, but I am sneaking it in because the species range does extend into Western Canada as well. 
And so what happens next between those newly produced queens and males, the parents of next year's generation? Mating, which is actually really interesting in bumblebees, as I am alluding to in these pictures. Um, males have a variety of different tactics for pursuing queens to mate with, including searching, mate guarding, patrolling, perching, and even scent marking. Um, and males of certain species of bumblebees, typically those that show patrolling or perch and chase behavior, can actually have super enlarged eyes compared to females of the same species, like giant googly eyes, the better to see with my dear. And an individual of the male persuasion of one of these large eyed species in particular was actually observed at the top of the Empire State Building, 102 stories up. Talk about the best perch. I'm sure he had the absolute best vantage point for seeing all the queens below him. <laughs> and though multiple matings are possible in bumblebees and uh, bee some attempts like the one illustrated here behind the censored block that actually made its way into the local news recently are actually quite common scramble competition is the males try and get at the, the queen at the same time. But most species are actually typically monandrous, which means that a queen mates with only one male, or at least she stores sperm from only one male, as colonies usually just have one dad. And so queens are typically pretty choosy and are often observed to reject most males in the lab and will even sting overly persistent males to death. So, um, but once a male has successfully locked his claw-like genitalia into the object of his affections compatible genital capsule, it seems like males control the actual copulation duration and the time that bumblebees spend attached like this can vary quite a bit. And uh, I think from minutes to hours, and I think it's even been recorded over a day, they can spend attached. Um, and I suspect it might also vary by species. And it's when a couple is ensnared like this that we're most likely to come across them, which you can see here in the top series of photos that I took of the first bumblebee couple that I ever observed last year of two yellow-headed bumblebees or Bombus flavifrons, where the male was enthusiastically vibrating his antenna. You can kind of see the motion blur in that middle and last picture. And the difference in appearance between these two bees is quite striking, sexual dimorphism here. And though <laughs> moments ago I did say compatible genital capsule, I actually came across the photo on the bottom left here uh, while verifying photos on Bumblebee Watch the other day. And uh, it is showing a particularly overconfident male yellow-faced bumblebee, Bombus fosnesenskii, attempting an interspecies romance with a western bumblebee. Bombus occidentalis. So I might have slightly oversold the uh, bumblebees are geniuses angle earlier, but <laughs> say la vie. And so we have finally arrived at the end and the beginning of the life cycle where mated queens who have stored one lucky suitor's sperm internally go off independently to find locations that are usually underground to hibernate for the winter and everyone else in the colony dies as the summer season comes to a close. And as a matter of fact, not a lot is known about the mysterious queen overwintering phase of the bumblebee life cycle. So I will just leave you all with that cliffhanger and direct you towards this really cool new community science project aiming to gather more information on bumblebee overwintering habits. So check it out at queenquest.org. And on to section two, bumblebee diversity. So I'm going to go here through here a bit more of an explanation as to why Western Canada is so special in terms of its regional bumble 
be diversity. And this background image here is composed of the 24 Western Canadian species of bumblebee that I have successfully captured on camera with plenty more still to find. So Western Canada and actually British Columbia on its own is the most diverse of all provinces and states for bumblebees in North America. And there are now a total of 47 species of bumblebees in the continent and about 35, give or take, are located in this region. So if you've been following along with some of the previous wild world of bee talks, you may already know that regions that are typically quite high in any regular old bee diversity tend to be warmer and drier, um, kind of more like a Mediterranean climate type feel, which doesn't really sound like Western Canada. And it's true, British Columbia and Alberta can't really compete with some of the more diverse states in terms of overall bee species diversity, but bumblebees are a little different. So bumblebee diversity is actually highest in cool temperate regions, especially montane locations with lots of variation in elevation. So that sounds more like us. Um, but not only that, the circled regions here on this slide are particularly important for bumping up our regional species total. Because you might be thinking, why specifically Western Canada, since most of Canada fits the definition of cool, temperate, and montane. <laughs> Specifically, high habitat diversity makes for high bumblebee diversity. So BC and Alberta exist at the con this confluence of many categorically different ecozones, which you can see quite clearly here, boxed in the red. And though bumblebees are generally cool, temperate specialists, certain species are more like plains or coastal or Arctic specialists. And Western Canada contains a bit of each of those habitat types. So future bumblers. Here is your species list. <laughs> and as I make sure to emphasize in all of my presentations, birding is lame, totally old news, barely any diversity really, entomology is where it's at. And if you want to break into melatology, start with a perfectly achievable species list and become a bumbler instead of a birder. Uh, I unfortunately won't have time today to teach you much about how to identify each of these species, but I highly recommend this book, which is the North American Bumblebee Bible. Um, and also to stay up to date on Native Bee Society of BC News, as I will likely be teaching some introductory bumblebee identification webinars over the winter. So this is just a combination <laughs> brag and piece of encouragement, I promise. So I have been bumbling for, like I said, almost 10 years now, and like Obviously, I'm super obsessed, uh, but I still have only confirmed observations of the species with the check marks. So that's 28 different species. And underlined and bolded are seven species that I'm still on the hunt for. So this is really a great potential long term hobby. And I know y'all are looking for new hobbies these days. So would recommend. But let's focus in a bit on the particularly special extra species that add to Western Canada's diversity tally. So a lot of them that don't really occur anywhere else in Canada are clumped right around the southern border with the US. So those of you tuning in from the states of the Pacific Northwest are likely more familiar with these species than most of us Canadians are. So the first set of three are particularly interesting because they look almost identical. <laughs> it's not obvious at all, but I cheated a bit here as I only have confirmed photographs of Bombas vosnesenskii in the field. And so I just copied that photo for the other two because like close enough. <laughs> and this set of yellow faced bumblebees all have similar overlapping ranges and each have the same story of just barely extending up into Canada to contribute to our larger overall species pool. 
And of course, this becomes especially interesting when you start to think about conservation management and prioritization based on some of these arbitrary human created borders. And here are three more species whose ranges barely peak up beyond the 49th parallel, but still count towards our regional species tally. So Bombus morrisoni, Bombus griseocollis, and Bombus pennsylvanicus are rare, but southern observations in BC or Alberta. But what really makes our species pool that much more special than your average Pacific Northwest state is the combination of those southern peekaboo species with our members of the subgenus Alpinobombus, the high elevation and Arctic specialists. And the high country bumblebee or Bombus kerbialis, pictured here on the right, is reasonably locally common wherever there are mountains. Uh, but with confirmed observations of two tundra specialists in Bombus jonellus and Bombus polaris, the true regional rarities really lie in these northern species. And the bee on the pin actually has an interesting personal story attached to it. So that bee is a bee that I collected during my first PhD field season near the central coast of BC last year that was a mystery bee for a very long time. So I took that photo in a series quite shortly after I caught her and I posted them on Twitter with a call to the real heavyweight bumblebee biologist to help me out. Um, but even they were stumped without a microscope. I took her home to the lab to look more closely and still wasn't confident. So I ended up trucking a few other similar specimens all the way across the country to Toronto, Ontario for last year's building our methods using sound science, AKA Bombus Bumblebee Conference, where the primary offer, author of the Bumblebee Bible himself, Paul Williams, took my bee back overseas with him to confirm against the Natural History Museum collection that she was indeed a Bombus jonellus. And as far as I'm aware, there have been few to no observations of this species in BC since before 1996. And the published pre-1996 observation was about 600 kilometers due north of mine. And so to my knowledge, this was by far the furthest south this species has ever been observed in British Columbia, which is kind of surprising. But when you consider the distribution of sampling effort, maybe not so surprising. And so this is a heat map that I pulled from Bumblebee Watch showing the sampling density across Western Canada for bumblebees. And it's pretty clear, not many people live up closer to the northern borders and those that do haven't seemed to pick up bumbling yet. So if you know anyone up there, let them know that we need their skills. And so it's worthwhile to ask the question, if we have so many species, which ones don't we have? And for the top three listed here, given the information I just shared with you, you might be just as likely as me to suspect that they really do extend down into British Columbia and we just haven't looked hard enough in the right places yet. While the rest of the missing species just happen to be primarily restricted to other areas of the continent, mostly Southern and Eastern specialist species. And so, <laughs> to grab your attention, in the background, you are watching what is uh, the technical term, a bumble nado, <laughs> which is the end stage of processing lethally collected bumblebees for identification. So here I have taken bumblebees that I caught into a preservative for my PhD research after a bath where I washed these bumble bodies. I then placed them into this jar with some crumpled up paper towel for a very high end salon blowout to fluff up their fur for subsequent identification. And as part of my PhD, one of my goals is to attempt to quantify regionally specific long term trends in bumblebee populations in British Columbia. And as I have hopefully convinced you in the past few slides, we don't have great geographical coverage from our current sampling regimes. And as the Oregon Bee Atlas has effectively demonstrated already in the brief period they've been sampling across the state with all of the data produced, the information for quantifying even what sort of bee diversity we are working with 
at large landscape scales is severely lacking throughout much of North America. And it is clear from the Southern bias sampling through map that I showed that it's super important to recognize that we do have this highly clustered sampling through time. So an increase in monitoring and basic like fill in the gap biodiversity research combined with some advanced statistical methods will be required to fully describe the bumblebee fauna and their species specific population trends through time at a larger regional scale. And so that makes a perfect segue into my final and shortest topic since I have introduced you all to most of the background into conservation. And since Western Canada is so diverse in terms of overall bumblebee species, it's not a big surprise that we're also home to some of the species that are known to be in decline. Um, Canada has national species at risk le legislation, which is a bit backlogged in terms of formally protecting declining bumblebee species or really any insect species at all. Um, all of the species listed here on this slide have been assessed by the in Independent Scientific Advisory Panel, CACIWIC, or the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. Um, and they have been assessed at some level of risk from special concern all the way up to critically endangered, but only Bombus bohemicus and Bombus tericola have been formally listed under the Species at Risk Act, and both only within the past two years, though evidence of their decline has been clear for a lot longer than that. And so Bombus occidentalis and Bombus tericola are closely related evolutionarily, and they even at one point were historically considered to be color variations of the same species prior to DNA barcoding. Uh, unsurprisingly, the two parasitic bumblebee species that specialize at targeting the nests of occidentalis and tericola are also in decline. Bombus pennsylvanicus, I have indicated as a special case here uh, because there has actually only been a single observation that I know of in Alberta. And though there is evidence for their decline in Eastern Canada, they still have maintained relatively robust populations through most of the continental United States. And so this <laughs> will be totally embarrassing for me to sit and watch on camera for two minutes to a silent audience, but now I am going to play all of you a really dorky video that I made last year so you can be fully immersed into my feelings <laughs> at the time <laughs> that this video was made, um, which was at the end of my first PhD field season after making an unlikely discovery of one of the aforementioned declining species. So here we go. I'm in Bella Coola, British Columbia today. It's an absolutely beautiful day. And pretty much everywhere you look, there are Western bumblebees. Bombus occidentalis on a hawkweed. This guy's pretty sneaky. It's a little cool. This one's a bit busier. Yum, yum, yum. There's another. Oh. She goes. We got a party here. Looks like a queen and a boy snuggling together on an aster. Just hanging out with my friend. Two buddies having lunch together. Golden rod is tasty. Western bumblebee on Queen Anne's lace. I think I'm a bumblebee biologist, not a botanist. Oh, she's so cute! Get it! So this is so exciting because the western bumblebee is a species at risk. In Canada, it's been assessed as threatened, which means that there have been pretty substantial declines recorded in a lot of its range. It actually used to be one of the most common species across a lot of Western North America. And so being here 
is really incredible. These bees are everywhere. It's almost like stepping back in time. And so I'm really excited to see if I can try and figure out why they're doing so well here. All right, so this was a super cool discovery for me. Here is a map kind of showing where this population was. And it's especially interesting because it appears to be really restricted to the Bella Coola Valley, given the surrounding steep elevation gradients into the coastal mountains to the north and the south. And I'm looking to investigate movement and connectivity within this isolated population and whether there are any barriers to movement within the lower elevation zones, including human development, which you can see here is really minimal towards like the left, you see Bella Coola and kind of like along the valley, there's some agricultural development, but it's mostly restricted to the Western portion of the valley. And here I have added little Bombus occidentalis icons to indicate the slow decline in relative abundance that I observed of this species as you travel eastward up the Bella Coola Valley following a same general trend of decreasing rainfall or precipitation and increasing elevation from west to east. And so this population offers me a really unique opportunity to ask some basic ecological ecological questions about a species in decline in an area where it remains as kind of a window into the past, like I mentioned in the video, um, into its former abundance throughout its historical range. But since I don't really have any replicate populations to compare it to, it's likely pretty hard for me to determine exactly what it is that's allowing this species to thrive in this particular area over others. But I can compare biological or ecological characteristics of Bombus occidentalis to other common species in the area, potentially to make inferences about possible threats that may more heavily influence this species that's known to be decline or even extirpated in many other regions compared to stable species that occupy the same overlapping restricted valley range. So I'm particularly interested in the landscape genetics of this species. So I'm planning to examine how genetic connectivity and potential barriers to dispersal, like that human development piece, might affect Bombus occidentalis and whether that is any different from other locally abundant species that have more range-wide population stability, like for example, Bombus mixtus or Bombus melanopygus. And so that is it for me. And in summary, I hope that I have convinced you all of a few very important facts about bumblebees. Bumblebees are cool, both literally and figuratively, <laughs> and unique. <laughs> Bumbling is a very good hobby that you should all get into. There's still lots to learn about declining species biology. And please stay tuned with the Native Bee Society of BC for future Bumblebee ID webinars. And you can find us on social media or at our website. And that's it. <laughs> wow, that was awesome. Thank you, Sarah. I might start bumbling. <laughs> yeah, you will. <laughs> so I'll just uh, moderate the questions for you. Um, we have a, a ton of them here. Uh, so let's get started. Um, let's see, from Tony. Um, what causes some to have such different color? For example, um, Vaz usually has yellow and black colors, but this summer she collected some from a specific area that were white and cream and black rather than yellow and black. Um, any idea why that might be? Oh God, so like individual color variation? Uh, that is probably a complicated thing, I would guess. I know some people have been doing research into like the genetic component of color variation. I don't know if that's within species, um, but <laughs> what do you, do you know, Link? <laughs> oh, I would say it's a combination of um, the environment. So light colors get bleached out over time more. Um, and then also I find that um, a lot of 
individuals that are produced late in the season when there's a lot less resources available um, are just not quite as robust and healthy looking as earlier season specimens of workers or males. And so often some of the late season workers or males you'll find um, are, have much thinner and paler hair for whatever reason. And that's just my interpretation. Um, yeah, it could, it could have something to do with like nutrition too, I would guess. Um, so for Michael, what do you do to encourage queens to set up shop in your nest boxes? I know a lot of people um, struggle to get occupancy. So what are the insider tricks? Yes, I get this question a lot. And um, there aren't really any <laughs> insider tricks. Like we don't, we don't bait them. We don't really do it. Like it's literally just a wooden box. Um, we put like cotton, like raw cotton nesting material in inside them. And Honestly, the best trick that I have found by far is in the spring, early spring, once queens like are first starting to emerge, go sit in your yard and watch where the queens are flying. So like quite frequently, they'll like nest searching behavior is like flying low and kind of like zigzagging. And sometimes they'll go up against like fence lines and kind of follow lines in the landscape. And so I did that and I watched, they were like following one particular fence and kind of like going around like the stairs. And so I put boxes where they were investigating and I, I was determined to get a backyard colony that year because I had been trying for so long and never got bees in my boxes. And I got two queens out of five boxes that I put out. So that is your tip. <laughs> <laughs> Chase them around. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, from Rebecca, does tongue length of a species appear to affect resource preference? Um, I would say it definitely does. Like longer tongue bum bumblebees are more likely to like be more comfortable matching up with longer corolla flowers. But I think, I think generally like they will kind of forage on whatever flowers are around. They're not super picky, but I would say like preference probably is affected by tongue size or tongue length. Yeah, greatly. I'm sure. Um, from Marika Van Ruick. What tools do you use for your bumblebee videography? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> All of my videography was literally just on my iPhone. I was like, <laughs> I'm like the low budget version of Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> so like phones are super great for video. I like, I have a DSLR and I've attempted to video with it, but it's so much harder with the manual focus. Honestly, like mm -hmm. your phone is just way better. <laughs> <laughs> and easier. <laughs> Let's see from Tony. Um, how do you, Sarah, get the oily propylene glycol off and out of the bumblebee's body to make a nice looking specimen? When she pins them, glycol usually comes out of the thorax. <laughs> Yeah, I don't pin my bees right now. I just like fluff them and ID them and stick them back into the ethanol. And I found, so you want to get them out of the glycol ASAP. Like the longer they sit in the glycol, the worse it is. And so like as soon as you collect them, putting them into like 90% ethanol and then just like washing them over and over has worked for me. But honestly, they're like always pretty gross, especially after you stab them and everything leaks out of them. <laughs> Yeah. From Jared, is iNaturalist a good tool to report bumblebee sightings um, or is bumblebee watch preferred? <laughs> depends on who you talk to and kind of like depends on your motivations too. Like you can submit sightings to either iNaturalist or bumblebee watch. Bumblebee watch, you're probably going to be waiting longer to get an identification because iNaturalist, John Asher just like obsessively verifies every single bee that anybody submits all over the world. So he goes through the bumblebees and you'll get like a quicker ID. But with Bumblebee Watch, there is like a built-in identification tool that you can go through as you submit your photos. So you can submit your photo and then it asks you, it's like a matrix-based key where it asks you a bunch of questions about like different features of your bumblebee and it will like comb through the regional species pool and give you options for species that it thinks you have based on those characters. So Bumblebee Watch in that way might be a little bit better for learning how to identify bumblebees just because that tool 
tool I think is really useful, but honestly, like the data is just as accessible to researchers for your, either of them. So it's kind of just personal preference. Great. Uh, this is an interesting question from Rose. Um, she asks, have you ever seen clusters of bumblebees that appear drugged on thistles? And do you know what causes it? And then she notes that she saw numerous lethargic bumblebees on elk thistle and that someone mentioned that they had witnessed this behavior on bull thistle. Who done it? Interesting. I have never seen that actually, but I'm intrigued. I don't know, maybe like some sort of chemicals in the nectar? I don't know. What do you think, Clink? Do you have a guess? Have you seen that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I've observed bumblebees on thistles a lot. And uh, some of those um, species, bumblebee species of conservation concern, actually have a really strong yeah, I mentioned that. thistle. <laughs> um, so if, anyways, um, so actually what I suspect is that maybe those thistles have been sprayed. Mm because there's so many spraying programs for thistles um, that maybe they have some dose of uh, pesticides on them or herbicide. That's just a wild speculation though. Let's see from Lisa Robinson in Wenatchee. Did you see bee vase up in Bella Coola? And she's wondering if large numbers of them um, indicate that they've taken over the occidentalis areas. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thought. Um, I did not see Vaz up in the Bella Coola area. It's like quite a bit further north. Um, but they have become like one, by far one of the most common species in like the Vancouver area. And like that was pretty recent that they've like shifted up there. So I have heard people suggest that there might be some sort of replacement going on because Bombus occidentalis doesn't exist in the lower mainland, like near Vancouver, BC anymore. So possibly, but pretty hard to test, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Let's see from Jared, any tips on getting good photos for IDing? I can never seem to get the whole body in focus to properly ID th sightings. The good thing is that you can submit multiple photos <laughs> to the either iNaturalist or Bumblebee Watch. And honestly, usually you need a couple photos. Um, my tips, I, I take thousands and thousands of photos. <laughs> <laughs> and like maybe 10, 20 percent on a good day are like in focus <laughs> and identifiable. So I, I would say there are obviously tons of like macro photography tips, even like a, a common one that's easy is taking like video footage and taking stills from the video can be helpful. Um, but yeah, really just like trade off focus on different parts, like the abdomen kind of from above and the top of the thorax is important, kind of like the side view and maybe like a face shot, but yeah. Yeah, it's a good strategy. <laughs> From Ron, have you found that one uh, nest box design works better than others? Do you have any preference? So there are definitely a lot of like designs out there. There's like the boxes and then like the crazy like flower pots and like you can bury hoses and stuff and like a bunch of different methods. Honestly, like the square wooden box is like Ralph Carter from the University of Calgary has been tried and true using this very basic square box with cotton in it since the 80s. And it seems to work and it's easy so pretty much but honestly like i didn't mention um but for these large scale studies like a good occupation rate is about 10 percent. so like you're never really going to get a ton of occupation but it is what it is it's Except extra time. exciting when you get a colony then <laughs> <laughs> um mary joe mosby asks um do you have directions on how the nest boxes are built online? Um, they do exist. I think there are directions um, that I put together on Wildlife Preservation Canada's website while I was working with them, um, which, yeah, we can post somewhere, but um, honestly, square wooden box. <laughs> it's really, really basic. How big? 
<laughs> uh, I think like 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters is like internal dimensions. So like six, six, six inches by six inches internally. Perfect. Um, from Heike, how long did bumblebee workers live? Um, I think it varies a little bit on the, based on species, but typically like weeks to maybe like a month at the longest, like several broods of workers are produced over the course of a season. And how long do they live? Weeks to months. Weeks to months. Weeks to a month. Probably varies, probably depends on who eats them, how long it takes somebody to eat them. <laughs> Let's see, from Jesslyn, um, could you provide a link to download the slideshow presentation? Jesslyn, we will have this posted on YouTube in the next few days. Um, so you can watch it there as many times as you want. Um, and Sarah will have to ask about uh, getting the slide deck. Sarah? Uh, sure. I don't see why not. <laughs> there you go. Bonus. From Quinn Quinn, do you have any thoughts on the relationship between bee impatience and other populations of bumblebees in terms of decline? Dun, dun, dun. Mm, yeah, one thing that I actually cut out of this presentation because it was too long was discussion. So one of the species that is relatively newly in Western Canada is the eastern, the common eastern bumblebee, which obviously is not supposed to be here, um, introduced uh, I guess kind of accidentally, but they're brought over for greenhouse pollination primarily and got loose because who who to thunk that bumblebees could escape from greenhouses? But um, I, it's hard to say like obvious, so they're pretty well established in the greater Vancouver area now. Like they're one of the most common species in like a variety of areas, like all the way up the valley too. And they are like, highly competitive as a species like the colonies get really big kind of similar to bombus sensei as well as like these like kind of winners and losers in um species how they're doing um and these particular species big colonies very generalist start really early in the spring and end really early in the summer and fall so you can you could kind of guess that they would be out competing potentially other species that don't have that life history. Um, I know that there is research on the Bombus and Patients invasion in Washington state and I think there's been a little bit of monitoring here but as far as direct impacts I think it's kind of hard to test but like I would guess that they're there. It is like acting really as an invasive species at this point in the West, so. Hmm. Let's see, from Dave, um, how common is the bumblebee wax moth? That's a great question. And mm -hmm. he suspects that um, that's what gets into his nest boxes when his colonies decline and he's in Northwestern uh, Washington state. That's definitely the case. They're super common. Um, I feel like the populations are probably bolstered from honeybees because they also attack honeybee colonies. They're going after the wax, right? And yeah, I, I would say like almost every single bumblebee colony that I've ever had in a box has had some sort of wax moth parasitization so super common and definitely something to pay attention to especially for myself who likes to collect the colonies and hoard them in my freezer all year um, so I don't like when they get <laughs> eaten by wax moths <laughs> so it's really just like paying careful attention towards the end of the season you can usually towards the end like the colony starts to chill out and so it's safer to like peek in and look too because they're not really defensive anymore um, and so you can like check on them to see if you have like really gross worms eating your bumblebees and then you can bring it in, put it in the freezer so you can keep the colony remains. Great. There's, I love the colonies, they're so cool. Um, for those of you that are interested in building your own bumblebee nest box, um, a few people have posted links um, to videos and schematics for the bumblebee nest boxes. Those links are in the chat um, and also, um, there's, there's notes uh, from Sid Cannings about um, bumblebees that appear drugged, and then also from uh, Marika with the Native Bee Society of British Columbia. 
um, about a macro photography webinar that the society hosted, how to photograph bees. So there's a whole video on it. Um, and that, that's a great video. Um, let's see. Oh, from Nathan Fisk. I like this. Sarah, do you have any tips for spotting collagenosis in the field? <laughs> <laughs> Habitat type. <laughs> no. I don't. I don't know if you noticed on my species list that I was bragging about calogenosis is one of the ones that I have not confirmed because I haven't been able to <laughs> effectively tell the difference between vase and calognosis. I think like there's supposedly like yellow hairs on the sternites, but it's not like a super great character. Or so and size, like relative size, if but at the same time, like size in bumblebees is so variable. You can have like in the same colony, a super tiny worker and a super giant worker. So yeah, good luck. <laughs> the way to spot it in the field is to grab a whole bunch of them on the coast, take them into your house, look them under the microscope, figure out which one's the collagenosis and then let them go back in the field again. <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> um, Dave makes a great point. He's, he says that he's read that medical cotton catches the legs of bumblebees. So maybe that's not a preferred nesting material in the bumblebee boxes, medical cotton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, stay away from medical grade cotton. I, so we typically just use like unbleached, like upholsterers cotton. But the problem with that is like we buy it in these like absolutely ginormous rolls that are like 150 bucks a piece. And it's like a lifetime supply. So it's kind of hard to get like your own just a little bit of cotton. So bleached like standard cotton is also fine. It's just like, yeah, the surgical cotton, they get their little feet stuck and all like that. And we've got a, this is a tough question. Thanks, Marika Van Ruick. Um, <laughs> are there some species of bumblebees that can establish multiple colonies in one year? Ooh. Um, so I would say that's less about species and more about location. Like I do, there are definitely like multi-voltine, I think is the term for it, bumblebee colonies like further south when you have more of a longer growing season. Um, I have heard of it starting to happen as well, like potentially with climate change in the UK, there's more like winter colonies, but I don't think it's super common. That's all I know about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, here we go. A question from Bonnie Zand, another uh, BC native bee lover. Uh, do bumblebee workers show the same division of labor based on age um, that's present in honeybees? That's a really great question. That is. So there is some division of labor in bumblebees, like, but I think this may, so don't quote me on this, but I think it's more related to size than age. Like I think the smaller workers tend to stay in the nest and do like cleaning duties or like guard duties, whereas the larger workers are more likely to be foragers. Um, but so I don't think it's based on age. It's not the same as honeybees for sure, but there is like a little bit of like structure ish to bumblebees. It's the same, they're like primitively eusocial too. So workers can actually still lay eggs. So it's like the whole colony is, is a little ba more basic than the honeybees, I guess. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, I have a few more questions. Can other bees, um, I'm not sure how to interpret these questions, but uh, can other bee species or, or genera um, learn sociality like bumblebees? Learn sociality. Well, I guess like over an evolutionary time scale, they're learning sociality. So there, there are a number of like little bees like Lasioglossum and Helictus that are like primitively social. So like nest in aggregations or like sisters split the work kind of. And so there is kind of a trajectory towards you sociality, but like learning to be social, like an individ any individual bees would never learn to be social, but I think it's like slowly over time, some become more social. 
Yeah, it's certainly a possibility. There's sociality um, that's arisen many times um, within Hymenoptera. Um, what sampling structure did you use to assess the distribution of Occidentalis in the Bellacula Valley from Marika? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> There was no sampling structure. It was literally me walking around staring at like flowers. <laughs> so like further down in the valley, like I you kinda you saw all of those videos. Like literally I did not have to look anywhere. They were on every single flower everywhere. Like thousands and thousands of them. And then I also like had a friend who had a house a little bit further up valley and visited him and saw that there were like quite a few still, but not quite as insane. And then further up where we were actually staying during the field work in a cabin at Stewie, um, I did, we, I actually set out some traps just in like the backyard just to see what we had. And we did collect like a handful of Occidentalis, but they weren't the most common species anymore. So this is just kind of me intuiting that there's kind of a slow decline up the valley. Cool. Dave makes a couple great comments here. Um, his understanding is that the bumblebee wax moth is a completely different species from the honeybee wax moth um, and that the bumblebee wax moth doesn't get into his honeybee combs. I'll just make a point here. Uh, yeah. In the upcoming podcast, uh, there, is a, there is a new wax moth that's come over from the east that is in the Pacific Northwest. Learn about it on two episodes from now on pollination. Awesome. <laughs> Great timing. <laughs> Sweet. And yeah, I had no idea that there was a specialist bumblebee wax moth. All I knew is uh, the only species I know of are lesser and greater wax moths. And I thought they were pretty generalist, but news to me. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And also Dave suggests that um, the bumblebees really seem to like his fiberglass insulation. <laughs> and that's true. They're often found uh, colonizing um, fiberglass insulation, which is not the nicest stuff. Yeah, honestly, they're like pretty opportunistic. I don't think very picky and yeah. Oh, another question here from Bonnie. Um, why does bumblebee diversity increase in wetter and more montane areas compared to other types of bees? And does it have to do with their generalist nature or due to their sociality? Ooh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Pick up all um. Wow, what a question. So I so I don't think they're more diverse in wetter areas. It's more cooler. So like increase in wet doesn't mean increase in bumblebee diversity because there's only a few species that are actually like tolerant of wet areas. The coasts are not very diverse at all because um, bumblebees nest underground and when it's wet, the ground fills with water. Um, so, but like cooler, and more mountainous, I think would probably have to do with like a lot of their colder weather adaptations, like being super furry and having, um, they can actually, are one of the few insects that can self-regulate their temperature, like they have metabolic ability, they can buzz their wing muscles, and they actually need to be 30 degrees internally to be able to fly, and can fly in like crazy conditions, especially up in the Arctic, they can fly at like a couple degrees above Celsius, um, or above freezing. So as far as like what it's related to, like, sociality i don't know but i don't i'm just shooting from the hip here <laughs> yeah no i think all those um adaptations are uh, good justifications um from heike how do bumblebee how do bumblebees raise queens versus raising workers does it depend on f type of food as in the honeybees like Right, like royal jelly or whatever, I think, is fed to queens and honeybees. And so there's not something like that with bumblebees. And I actually, I've answered this question a couple times and I keep like second guessing myself because I'm not sure if there's new research that, um, that I haven't read that shows why queens are queens and why workers are workers. But as far like as I can understand it, it's about how much food they're fed like really the main difference between a worker and a queen is size in bumblebees and like when 
they're born, which is always later on in the season, but like what exactly the switch is to start that transition from workers to reproductives, I'm not sure. And like, I think like, well, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, workers can still lay eggs. And so there's like a little bit of a within colony, like physical domination of the queen on the workers. And so I'm not sure physiologically what the main difference is besides being fed more while they're developing. Um, people might know that, but it's outside of my current field. Yeah, I can't help you with that. <laughs> no. um, so we have one last question uh, from Nathan, and it's about processing uh, bee specimens. The bee NATO seems rough for prepping samples. Are the bees damaged with this drying method? Not at all. Um, exoskeleton means the skeleton is on the outside, so they're like pretty hardy. Um, and especially like when you're drying them, they're just like coming out of liquid. So they're like still pretty hydrated and soft. And so they're like pretty robust. They like tumble around, but like you occasionally might lose a leg, but usually, oh yeah, Marika said, exactly. Sam Drogi puts his bees in the dryer. <laughs> so yeah, they can take quite a bit of abuse. <laughs> So thank you, Sarah, for, have, or for, for joining us. Um, that was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed that. And uh, thanks everyone for all your great questions. Now, if you're interested in learning more about native bees, um, consider joining the Master Melitologist program. Please, it's tons of fun. The Master Melitologist program is a master gardener type program where you'll learn how to contribute to our Oregon Bee Atlas. Um, the program provides extensive learning opportunities about native bees and you'll have the opportunity to go on uh, bee research adventures, frolic in a conservation minded manner in wildflower meadows. You can contribute towards native bee conservation and make amazing scientific discoveries with the Oregon Bee Atlas. Our Atlas members are finding all sorts of new kinds of bees for the state of Oregon, um, and they're having a great time doing it. Now, projects like the Atlas are supported by grants and especially by donations. Please, please consider giving a gift to the Oregon Bee Atlas at any level by visiting our website or contact us to discuss endowments. When you leave, you'll be prompted by a short survey. Um, please take a minute to fill that out and just let us know what you'd like to to have presented during the wild world of bees. Um, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you in October. Good night.